Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist, episode uh, 93 with uh, Muhammad and myself. Uh, Muhammad, you know, I was just taking a look at the, you know, the Apple event. You remember yeah, those? I was just looking at that now. Well, I was looking at some tweets about it, yeah. <laughs> Are you into it? Are you, do you, I'm guessing you, you weren't watching the event, right? No, I don't really watch, I watch other stuff, but I don't, I haven't. I don't really watch Apple events because mm. I'm never expecting anything groundbreaking. <laughs> you know, I just, oh. however, I do end up whenever it's time to get a new phone, I do always end up getting the newest Apple phone. Um, Are you on one of those plans where like you just pay monthly and then you always get the newest one? No. Well, I'm on a plan with Vodafone like every two years. And then when it runs out, I just see what the newest phone is and get that okay. one. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, one thing that was interesting is they put like uh, magnets on the back of the phone. So you okay. can like, you know how the MacBooks, they have that charger snaps onto it with a magnet. Oh, yeah. So that's something interesting, Yanni. Something different, I would say. Mm. Like, you know, obviously, although it's good, like, for example, they, they have 5G uh, capability in, in the new phones. Like that's taking the same thing, making it better, right? But the interesting yeah. thing, just as a observer, is these new things, like a whole new kind of category or whatever, you know? Because I'm not, yeah. I, I'm not gonna really buy it anyway. I'm just kind of interested in what people do, innovation and stuff. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I literally just had a quick look now, and but it's not. I think a lot of it is just the. The capitalist side of it taking over as opposed to any sort of innovations that are really groundbreaking you know yeah i mean i think in the good days right good old days um like maybe five six years ago uh because phones or smartphones was a new category you have very fast innovation uh mm. whereas now uh, when when a technology a general technology category becomes more mature, then it's going to be slower, isn't it? So I think mm. that's what's happening. Like TVs, for example, like it'd be crazy to think of like watching a TV, you know, revealing event, like because TV is a boring category now. There's nothing yeah. we expect to go on there. Just whatever different uh, screen technologies, which we don't even know the difference between anyway. So yeah. as the phones get more mature, it becomes a bit you know, more boring. But you know, I realized when I bought my la latest phone, which I think is two years ago now, um, I realized like, damn, I bought, bought this phone compared to the iPhone. It's quite cheap to be honest, but it's still one of the top phones, right? Uh, S10 mm. at the time that was like the top Samsung phone or whatever. And then I, when I got it, I realized, damn, I, I'm setting up all this stuff on my phone. So I don't use it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't regret it because it's like uh, in the end I've got something that's very capable if I need it. So uh, it, sometimes if I want to make a video on it, I know it's very good camera. Um, mm. Or if I want to get like a language learning app, I know that it'll definitely run smoothly and fast and everything on it. So, Yanni, it's all right, you know, but definitely not gonna spend iPhone prices on a new phone. I think because just don't can't really justify. Not don't really make enough use of it. No, that's just it. You just want it to be reliable and you want it to, if you need it for a particular thing, I suppose keeping up, isn't it? Keeping up with everything. But um, yeah, I'm so, I, you know, there are some things about Androids that I prefer. Mm. However, I've been so, you know, uh, what's the word? I've bought into the infrastructure for so long that I just, yeah. I don't know if I can be bothered to swap over. Yeah, yeah. That's what. That's what they're doing. Actually, I saw the pricing of the new phone, and it, the the iPhone 12 starts at six hundred. Uh, sorry, seven hundred dollars. Right. I don't know what mm. they're going to do in the UK. Maybe they'll make it. Maybe they'll make it seven hundred pounds, six hundred pounds, which is actually cheaper than the last one, I think. Right. Uh, and mm. they're trying to do that because they're trying to get you into the ecosystem, and then they're trying to get you onto their um, like Apple TV subscription and news subscription and magazine subscription because those kind of uh, services are um like 90 percent profit for them you know yeah they're, yeah they're really lucrative so that's what they're doing now and also if you buy an iphone even if it's cheapish uh compared to other, you know the top kind of phones uh, you you'll be much more likely to buy the airpods and then the apple watch and then this and that so 
Um, that's their whole thing now, I think. It's pretty clever. Mm, but it, it is sucking more and more out of people. It, it, it does. I don't know, to be honest, Yanni, maybe, I don't know if you think this, but like people see Steve Jobs as the, you know, the passionate guy that he innovated for, for the passion of it. Obviously he built a business out of it as well, but, you know, and then the passion's kind of a bit gone now with him gone, but uh, I don't know to me too much about him. So. Yeah. I don't know anything about them too much at this stage. I mean, yeah, it just, it just seems, I don't think they're going to really um, come up with anything groundbreaking again. Uh, yeah. I think that's better left for other people now. Mm, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, man. Technology. I don't know why it's, it's so interesting, man. Like I was reading this book a couple of weeks ago, listening to this book called Technopoly. Okay. I recommend everybody uh, read any, any work really by uh, Neil Postman. There's one of his books, uh, Technopoly. Um, he was a, I don't know exactly what he did, but I know he's got quite a few books and his books co uh, follow the theme of, so techno Technopoly is basically about a society or civilization that kind of worships technology and it worships the new for the sake of the new and it worships and it's like obsessed with technology and using it to its maximum using it uh, where, where basically the technology dictates the direction society goes rather than society deciding where we want to go and then okay what technology do we need to get there so you know, to be honest with you, bro, like a lot of it goes over my head. Yeah, <laughs> I can't understand a lot of it, but it's it feels so re relevant to today to understand what we're grappling with in terms of AI and what's co what's coming there in terms of Neuralink and what's coming there in terms of social media and, and what's going on. So, uh, for example, one chapter is about uh, the obsession over using numbers and measuring stuff. Right. And, you know, I think most people listening, they understand that everything we do, we try and measure it. And that's like a more of a new phenomenon, right? Because we're able to measure stuff now. But that causes all kinds of biases that we don't actually see as biases. And um, basically, the technology is inf influencing the way we think. Whereas we, you know, maybe on a naive, um, innocent kind of level, we think technology just helps us do what we want to do better and easier but it actually influences what we think and how we think you know so that's what the whole book is about it's really really interesting um and it was written i think i know the amusing ourselves to death was written i think in the 70s and then technopoly was written in the 80s i think so this guy's visionary bro you can yeah. imagine like he's saying this stuff back then um so yeah this this uh, he was talking in technopoly about this of excitement and uh, it's like we you know how you might uh, uh support a football team you support like technologies and you like you get all these tech youtubers and you're excited about 5g or this or that and it's like it's kind of funny you know if you step back and look at it from from a you know ten thousand uh foot view it's like why are these guys getting so excited about it you know um but he said this is what it does it it's actually part of the propaganda machine that that kind of gets you in this fandom of technology mm. yep. it's, like, it's like that with any industry really if you're into it you'll just get bought into it like there's a lot of events and stuff that i might watch especially like live live events and stuff and mm. they're they're not always groundbreaking but if you're into that sort of industry like the hype machine that you yes. just jump on the hype train and you get caught up with it yeah yeah but i i think the difference here though is that um it's the average person who's kind of into into this, into say, phone technology or electric car technology. You know, it's it, it's partly maybe the really good marketing and stuff, but it's the average person now that's really more and more getting pulled yeah. into it and interested in it. So yeah. it's it's kind of uh, it's a new new thing, a new era, I suppose. Um, I wanted to talk to you today, bro, about because it's uh, October, right? So a lot of people are going to uni. Um, or they started going to uni last month or something. I don't know if in the UK, are people like going in uh, physically or do you know? They, they definitely, they're definitely in town. We've got a couple of universities here. So they're definitely in town. Mm. Whether they're actually going into the campuses to study, I don't think they are. Right. Um, I think they were due to, and then they got shut down 
from doing right. so yeah like yeah. a week after they got here mm. um, but but they are local at least and i think yeah. they're just doing stuff online uh, maybe going in just for like labs and these things that you can't mm. not do uh physically yeah so uh, i know i think one of the first five episodes we did we talked about education i think yeah so, yeah, yeah so we could do a bit of a recap uh, not a recap but uh you know revisiting the topic um, especially, I think actually things have maybe changed. It's probably been three years since we did that episode, but yeah. Like what are your thoughts, bro? Like, especially since what's happened in the last uh, six months or whatever, uh, you know, imagine your son is like 16, 17. Are you like getting him ready for uni? Are you encouraging him towards mm. any direction? What's, what's your kind of thoughts, you know? Um, I still maintain I don't know actually what what I said last time. It was a while ago, wasn't it? But yeah, yeah. I'm of the opinion that it all depends on what you want to do. Like I think university is only useful for a set few, a set few job, you know, avenues, um, mm. such as you know, medicine, for example. Like you can't be a doctor without going to uni. I don't know if you can yes. ever do that. Um, that's one thing. You know, nursing, um, law, maybe. I don't know, um, but. Yeah, it depends where you want to go. It depends if you've got a plan to go somewhere. Yeah. And I suppose, I suppose the the other one is if you don't have a plan, should you mm -hmm. go to uni? You know, that's mm -hmm. the real question because a lot of people don't know what they're doing and they think, okay, well, I'll go to uni anyway to improve my prospects. And maybe, you know, I, I can't say no. Maybe it's um, it's valuable. I mean, if I could go back and study, yeah, then I probably would. If you know, if someone gave me the opportunity to, because there's always things to learn. There's always things to expose yourself to. And uh, that culture of, of learning and studying is quite nice, you know? Um, yeah. And I miss that in a way uh, because, you know, you spend your, I remember spending my whole, obviously education life. Can't, can't wait for it to end sort of thing. And then when it does end, it's like everything just comes to a halt. You know, there's no yeah. more learning. There's no more improvement. There's nothing to go to anymore. Mm. It's just, it's just, you know, but, but at the same time, it gives you an opportunity to, to uh, what's the word, to explore your own avenues of education. Like now, for example, you know, the amount of stuff that's online, the amount of courses, the amount of even free material just on YouTube, you know, how many like uh, docu-series is or, or, you know, even Islamically speaking, how many things are available just to sink your teeth into? You can just spend it an endless amount of time studying whatever you want without without any real consequence but you know you're not going to get the qualification it depends how much that qualification means to you it depends how much you want to um use that avenue to go into find the you know field of work in that area so yeah that's that's ultimately i think it's about establishing you know if it was my kids it's about establishing where they want to go and what they want to do and then seeing if it's a necessary avenue or not mm. yeah. yeah yeah i mean <clears throat> If they're in school, I think there is the the whole talk of, you know, what GCSEs are you going to do so that which A levels you do so that which you know degree you do, um, and there isn't much room for thinking outside of that paradigm, really, in it. Sorry, my my wife texted me there, threw me off. Repeat what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying. Uh, uh, like I agree with you, yeah. That, and uh, if you want to do like uh, medicine, you know, pharmacology, etc., you probably need to go uni, right? There's no kind of alternative uh, from. Yeah, I'm exactly, right? exactly. But, but but when you when you're in school, you know, if your kids are in school, they're in secondary school. Um, all the talk is about GCSEs to then pick A levels to then pick a degree, right? Mm. So if you're not going to follow that route, I mean, just from a peer pressure point of view. If you're, you know, doing your A levels and you're like, yeah, I'm not really gonna apply to uni, it's weird. You know, that's the first you know, layer of resistance, I suppose. And then, you know, you just need some path. If it's not mm. uni, you still need some path in it. Um, mm. So pff, it's difficult. Um, I think, I think, you know, that I don't think the education system. Then again, it's it's hard because when I speak to my sister who's at college now. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of changes that I'm not aware of. You know, I've mm. still got it in my head that the system is still the same as it was when I was there. Okay. You know, 
Um, so it seems more advanced and open and, and, and innovative now because I was always thinking like um, it's a rigid set structure when, when society is ever changing and the role, you know, the nature of jobs at the moment is ever changing and you yeah. know, there's opportunities for entrepreneurship or online work or, you know, the vast innovations in technology that's transforming what job prospects there are, yeah. how I can understand maybe university can accommodate for that, but how does, uh, secondary school or college accommodate yeah. for that one there's yeah. there, there's no there's, there hasn't got that variety you know um so uh, whether whether they can innovate in that field whether they can you know introduce mm. i mean like for example like coding coding i feel like should be something that that starts i mean i did I, it back at school so mm. i remember there was some light coding there but i think coding should have its own dedicated like sort of course at least at college um yeah for sure to get to get people into that because but, that's you yeah. know but you know you know you said when you finish uni like you kind of stopped learning at that point right yeah uh, you know i i in my mind that that's not true right because yeah uh subhanallah i don't know why but but i never stopped learning actually or you could even say i learned more when i finished uni right um mm. i i just I, I've just, I guess I'm that type. I'm just lifelong learner, always trying to learn stuff. And, yeah. you know, what I do now for a living is all self-taught 100%, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, of course. So I'm just like, uh, learn, 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 right? Um, and I feel like after, <clears throat> you could say after all these years, right? <laughs> after all these years of, of learning, I feel like the best way to learn most of the time is just to do and mm. to like, actually have to solve problems, like solve real life problems. Uh, where, where, not real life, sorry, but solve real problems, meaning uh, rather than learn theory and answer questions about the theory, you're just put into a problem solving environment where you have to do it, right? So that could yeah. be by uh, doing an internship or a job or mentorship or this. I, I just feel like that is like way quicker way to learn. And it's actually uh, more efficient in terms of you're going to learn the actual sk skills and stuff that you need. Mm -hmm. There's always some areas where you need a bit of theory for sure. But mm -hmm. uh, I just feel like that's the case, right? So for example, uh, coding, right? So to be a, some kind of developer, whether it's for, I, I, I'm not sure how different it is, whether you're going to like make uh, phone apps or you're going to make, um, you know, backend systems, front end, whatever. I don't know how yeah. different these things are, but I feel like uh, I know there are these uh, coding boot camps where within about three months you you actually should be employable okay so uh, i know for, uh, if people are interested like uh, in america i've heard of these where you do i think three months maybe six months and you do it for free okay obviously yeah. they're gonna they're gonna be quite uh, re, uh what's the word uh, discerning and picky with who gets in but what but if you get in it's free and then when you leave you you're supposed to be quite easy to get a job and then you pay them back um with that salary right so you pay them a certain amount out of your monthly salary until you've pay, uh, paid them uh, i think it's up to thirty thousand dollars or something right and God. that's that's like a whole new uh, model though right it's like you don't pay up front which means poorer people can access it and it might be something like you only pay them uh based on your salary that you get right mm -hmm. and there's a cap on how much you can pay them and all this stuff so it's like revolutionary in terms of the speed of you know get, getting through education to then actually be able to be paid for for your skill and mm -hmm. then also it's revolutionary in terms of like uh, more access to people who can't afford uni you know so you know this, this is kind of interesting to me you know this kind of stuff and i this i feel like the same applies to marketing right like what i do um, if you uh, were parachuted into a small company where not a small company or like a marketing team and you were touching so many different areas, six months, 12 months, like you'll be good. Like you, you'll be then employable after that, uh, probably more employable and have more practical skills than uh, than if you did a three year marketing degree, to be honest, you know, so wh whether the, the, the education system is moving that direction or not. I, I can't unlearn what I've just told you. Like, I can't not think that way. So wh when I think of uh, my kids and their education, I just feel like you don't need to sit in a classroom or in a whatever environment to learn, learn, learn for, for years in a row. I think you just learn, no, sorry, just do. Like you get mm -hmm. into an environment, however, where you're just doing. Um, 
and ideally, you know, with really good professionals, you know, people who are really good at whatever they do and just like follow and learn, follow and learn. I, I just really feel like that's the way. Um, obviously, there are going to be exceptions where that might not make sense, but that just really, really makes sense, man. Hmm. I like the idea that you spoke about regarding companies sort of um, doing it in reverse almost. So they're like almost funding you, funding your study for, for you to then pay it back. I mean, I'm sure there's probably companies now that are creating their own courses, um, long-term courses, not just yes. like, you know, a few months training or whatever. Yeah, but you know, uh, Dyson. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, Dyson, I mean, I know them for the vacuum cleaner, but apparently they do a ton of different things. Um they couldn't find enough engineers to employ. Right. So they made right. their own uni, <laughs> you know, they That's made great. their own uni because they're like, okay, we need to recruit say a hundred engineers a year. So we, we can't find good enough ones. And if we educate them ourselves, then I guess they're going to be thinking the way we want them to think when they work for us. And so that's perfect. You know, so they, uh, I heard they actually went and did that. So that's kind of crazy. But, and then uh, can you imagine like someone like Google who uh, employs, uh, I think over a hundred thousand people, like it would also make sense for them to do the same. So uh, yeah. it's interesting what uh, I, I was listening to a podcast actually about, uh, education and how it's changing or how it might change because of uh, corona because you know in the U u.s especially it's very difficult to justify uh someone paying 30 40 50 thousand dollars a year when you're not even in the cat on the campus you know so you're yeah. not getting the social life you're not getting the networking you're not getting the you know people value the physical stuff right uh, more than just like knowledge or whatever it is so yeah. you're not getting any of that and a lot of these unis are saying yeah same fees you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. so so it's becoming hard to justify. Now, on top of that, a lot of these unis they don't they, they don't know of the technology side of how to enable people to learn remotely. Okay, so now who comes onto the scene? People like Google, people like Facebook, people like Apple, and they say, look, we'll help. The, we'll be the technology layer for education for the new world of education. But yeah. uh, and so you can think, you can imagine that a company like Google might uh, partner with whatever Stanford or whatever and say, look, we're doing courses online, uh, you know, degrees online or whatever it is, you know, or Google might just say, look, um, you know, I think we know a thing or two about engineering because, you know, we employ and we do engineering yeah, yeah. day in, day out. So we'll just educate you. And yeah. I think that the, there's a big, uh, especially in the U S I think there's going to be a big revolution in terms of that, because I, I think finally people might wake up to the fact that you're just paying a ton and ton, a ton of money and might not make sense. But it also means it can replicate everything. And that means like that the technically, if it all moves online or all moves to technology, then there's no real limit on how many students can fit into one yeah, yeah, institution. Yeah. Well, you know? well, this you is could... what the guy is saying as well on the podcast. He's saying that someone like Harvard, they artificially limit the places to make it mm. a like, like he's like, it's literally a luxury brand. You know, yeah. they make the, the spaces limited and the price is so high to make it that luxury brand where it's like exclusive, only a few can access it. Whereas if they wanted, they could have uh, added 10, 20,000 extra students, you know, um, every year. Yeah. They, they could increase their capacity, but they want it to be an exclusive thing. But now when yeah. it's online, you're right. It's like, uh, well, what's your excuse now, you know? And it's also, it also opens up sort of room for worldwide education, like somebody in, yes. you know, in, in the Middle East or Africa can then study, yes. you know, a curriculum abroad, um, just like, uh, you know, my kids would have access to here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's what, especially for countries. I mean, think about, think about Muslim countries where they're absolutely blocked. Like look at, okay, look at people in Palestine, for example, yeah. that are completely blockaded from an access, from, from access to opportunities, um, like I've, there's so many stories you hear of, you know, sisters that you know have studied so much, but then they they have an opportunity to go abroad and they can't because obviously they're blockaded, etc. Um, it can't be easy, and, and maybe this this internet revolution or this this revolution in terms of education um, can really open doors for 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 brothers and sisters worldwide. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you know, that's all of that is education when it comes to like skills that will make you valuable economically, right? Yeah. But of course, there is the whole element of like learning for the sake of learning. And that's that's mm. originally what the was originally what it was all about. Right. Um, in terms of yeah. learning for the sake of Allah or learning to become. 
<laughs> or learning <laughs> to become uh, like more just cultured and all of this stuff, right? So that is something that we, we need to, to kind of speak about as well, because especially as Muslims, it shouldn't be that that is what education is. You know, education mm -hmm. is to make money. You know, that's fine for, for that side of things, but we can't just forget the other side and the, the point of it. You know, when people say, oh, like the, the degree costs X amount and I'm only going to earn X amount per year. It doesn't make, yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. But the other way is, uh, you know, beneficial knowledge or yeah. knowledge of Allah. You know, these things have a different value than just putting a, a pound or a dollar amount on them, isn't it? Mm. And, and when it comes to especially the Islamic sciences, I think... Personally, I think there is, there is uh, uh, you know, for something intermediate to advanced, I think there's actually maybe a danger in teaching that stuff online, you know, without real connection to a murabbi figure, you know, a figure who's going to teach you the akhlaq with the knowledge, you know, because knowing the technical science and not knowing the manners that must be absolutely stuck to it, glued to mm -hmm. it, Will, mm. can actually damage you and damage the people that you then go on to teach. Mm. Uh, so I think for basic stuff, like, you know, just listening to some tafsir or some uh, sera or some fiqh, you know, that everybody needs, that I think that's amazing for the, for the internet. But then when we start going into, like, more detailed fiqh or more advanced fiqh, or we start going to uh, usul, um, usul al-fiqh, or uh, maybe more advanced aqidah, all of this stuff... Really, I think it should be with somebody they know you. They know that you yeah, know you understand yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like that. That's definitely, a huge yeah. deal. I think a huge deal. No, definitely. I did. Uh, I did my first sort of training day. I had a training day at work where I had to do it at home on Zoom. Um, yeah. That didn't go too well, really. <laughs> it's just it was like all day long, and I just was not paying attention. Like, um, well, Impossible, I say it was man. not. Yeah, I was, but like not engaged. I wasn't engaged at all, you know. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I think a few months ago, I, I I joined the you know the Thinking Muslim series of webinars, and those were a couple of hours per week. Yeah. And while yani two two hours at an unideal time, uh, especially if you have kids, that's difficult, man. Like uh, mm. it's difficult. You need uh, you need you know that versus. I remember once in Dubai, I went to a, it was, uh, it was actually 15 days every day. There was, uh, you know, a topic covered, right. Uh, and yeah. this was like a different, it was like a, an introduction to all the different Islamic sciences. Okay. And in that, I was like three to four hours, I think just sitting in the masjid, taking notes and, you know, you take a little break here and there, but that's like, I was, I actually didn't lose concentration. I was like pretty much fully focused. Um, just because I'm in the environment, everyone is like, looks focused, at least there's no distractions, mm. like huge difference. Like I couldn't do two hours in that scenario, but in the other one, I could do four hours, you know, so big difference, big difference. Yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be able to hit it off as, as great as they want it to. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it may be suitable for like an hour here and there, but to, yeah. To do like entire days on it, I don't mm. think it's feasible yeah. whatsoever. Some Someone was actually, probably a year ago now, someone was like, uh, you know, asking for my input on uh, creating an Islamic Studies Institute. Uh, and I think, yeah, it, it was going to be online, okay? Like fully online. And I said, look, uh, online, that's cool. But you have, you have two big issues. One is participation. And two is terbia. He's mm. like, I'm like, if you don't solve these two things... Uh, you might as well not do it. You know, mm. you can't just go and follow what everyone else is doing, which is, for example, pre-recorded stuff that you have to sit in your own time and focus and then watch it. And then what happens, right? Mm. I'm like, you can't be doing that. You've got to find some way, be creative somehow of getting the terbiya element, you know, mm. have, for example, everything must be live. Uh, or for example, uh, you need to have, you have the main teacher who teaches you the, the stuff, but then you have like a murabbi. And the murabbi is like, uh, let's say once a week, they have a half hour, one hour call with each student. And like, okay, what are your goals? What are you doing? Are you doing your hiv? Are you doing this? Uh, yep. have, you met, have you revised that? Uh, whatever it is, uh, obviously I don't have the, yeah, I'm not an expert in this, but I said you need to sort that out. So 
he said, you know, he really took that on board and stuff. So they haven't launched yet. So we'll see what comes out of that. But mm. the, I, I, when I sat with him and I discussed just random ideas of kind of off the top of my head in terms of what could be done online from a Terbia you know, point of view, there was actually a lot of possibilities and I haven't seen anyone do it. So that could be interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's something hasn't been explored, is it? Um, not that I know of anyway. Uh, but ultimately, is it ever going to be, um, you know, the, the traditional one-to-one? I don't know. Like I've seen the effects of physical, you know, of, of, of um, clinging to teachers, especially when they're, uh, when the classes are small, et cetera, it completely transforms people, you know, yeah. um, you know, a close brother of, of mine, um, he's, he's clung so much to his teacher that you just see his teacher in him all the time now, you know, it's completely transformed him. It's crazy. So I find it amazing. Yeah, that's what we want, man. Especially if you're not going to be a, an actual scholar, you know, you're going to give fatwa, you're going to be on some uh, council to advise people on this and that. If that's not you, then you need to you need to gain this knowledge to transform yourself, isn't it? Try and get to mm. gender through it. Mm. And that's what it's supposed to do. Um, that's what it's supposed to do, man. It's supposed to increase your fear of Allah, your knowledge of Allah, and, and you're supposed to act in accordance. And unfortunately, sometimes when you learn the knowledge without the other side, the the character development, you actually start using the knowledge for negative stuff in it. So, mm. Mm. <laughs> let, bro, I actually had this uh, post I wanted to share. Uh, so I'll just read through it. Yeah, it was a series of tweets, and I thought it was really interesting about um, education. So this guy says, uh, David Bowles. He says, um, I'll let you in on a secret. I have a doctorate in education, but the field's basically just 100 years old. We don't really know what we're doing. Our scholarly understanding of how learning happens is like astronomy 2,000 years ago. Most classroom practice is astrology. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, man. What was... Come on, man. Where's the rest of these tweets? Uh... Oh man, looks like I've lost it, man. Oh, dude, it, it, it's sounding good, isn't it? At the beginning, <laughs> let me try and refresh it and I'll find it. So, here's the first one. No. Nope. Yeah, as we talk, I can try and look for it. Um, yeah, man, so. Help me out here, bro. <laughs> what was the vibe? What's the vibe of what they were trying to say? So they're saying essentially that the, the, the actual study of studying or the study of education itself is it something that's basically innovated? They're saying it's com completely, uh, we're still oh. new to this. Okay, I've got it. I've, I've actually found it. Okay, so yeah, he said most classrooms. Are... Okay, then he said, yeah, before the late 19th century, no human society had ever attempted to formally educate the entire populace. It was either a strict aristocracy, meritocracy, or a blend, and always male we're still smack dab in the middle of the largest experiment on children ever done. Right. Most, most teachers per, 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 perpetuate the banking model uh, used on them by their teachers, who likewise inherited it from theirs, etc. Thus, the elite style of instruction continues, even though it's ineffectual with most kids. Uh, mm. That style is like uh, the lecture style. Uh, what's worse, the key strategies we've discovered, driven by cognitive science and child psychology, are quite regularly dismissed by pencil-pushing, test-driven administrators. Much like Trump ignores science, the majority of principals and superintendents I've known flout research. Some definitions, blah, blah, blah. Okay, skip that bit. Things we uh, do know. Homework doesn't really help, especially younger kids. Uh, also, students don't learn a thing from testing. Most teachers don't, e don't either. And then he said, it's supposed to help teachers tweak instruction, but that rarely happens. 
and he know uh, also what we know is spending too much time on weak subjects hurts. Uh, do you want kids to learn? Here's something we've discovered. Kids learn things that matter to them, either because the knowledge and skills are cool or because they give the kids tools to liberate themselves and their communities. Mm. Maintaining the status quo? Nope. Kids are actually aware of injustice and by nature rebellious against the systems of authority that keep keep autonomy away from them. If you're perpetuating those systems, teachers, you've already lost. They won't be learning much from you except what not to become. Uh, sure, you can wear them down. That's what mo happened to most of you, isn't it? You saw the hideous flaw in the world and wanted to heal it. But year after numbing year, they made you learn their dogma by rote. And now many of you are breaking the souls of children too. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, so basically saying that uh, the, the current way is just is based, I'm, I suppose, the current way uh, um, most people are learning in schools, it was designed for like a few elite people to be in a small classroom with one teacher, for example. Mm. That's what I'm understanding from it anyway. That, that we've copy pasted it now to classrooms with 20, 25, 30 kids sometimes. Uh, who knows, Yanni, in many countries, I'm sure it's more than 30 kids. And, um, and, and then it's all based on stuff which is not proven or anything. And then he said the stuff that is, does seem to be proven from research, it's not being, you know, implemented. So right. Yanni, for me, I don't know how, I, I mean, he says he's, you know, he's got a PhD and all that. Um, and obviously this type of post usually, you know, would get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, go viral and all that. However, the main thing I'm getting from this is like, yes, it's true. We don't know what really works. And, and I think learning is very complicated. I mean, I, I've got a PGCE, so we did learn the theory of learning uh, when I was doing that. And it did honestly <laughs> sound very um, complicated. And it did sound like there was a lot of uh, things that are not conclusive, you know, so right. they'll be telling us like, okay, uh, this is the latest thing in teaching that you know, you should really try and it seems really good for kids to learn. But then there's always this caveat of, yeah, it's like not fully, fully proven that it works, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, crazy, man. Yeah, well, kids kids have been saying that for years, haven't they? Uh, I remember obviously we were there saying it when we were at school that we just can't learn. Like, you know, I've had an entire class. I've been in classes where the entire class have failed, you know, including myself. Mm -hmm. Um it's just a lack of connection or a lack of like the things that seemed to work at least with me was um one-to-one -one mentorship mm. but that was mainly for practical studies so like you know like look at now at work to, to learn the craft of my work i had to be you know uh paired up with somebody who is basically like a mentor yeah. where i could see them doing it and then uh, they could observe me having a go at whatever it is that i needed to do to yeah. the point where you know that's it and then you 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 sort of adopt yeah. practices from other people but you can't obviously apply that to every single thing but i'm sure there's an element of that that does that can be crossed over you know the one-to-one -one yeah. nature of it or mm. you know a role yeah. model that you can emulate mm. yeah sometimes it's like in business when uh, i'm working with a you know someone that works for me um you know sometimes we they'll they'll raise certain things and ask for my input like how would you deal with this and mm. i always firstly i try anyway to first ask them what would you do right? Because yeah. I feel like the uh, action of them putting effort into thinking of the answer, it helps them to learn for next time. Whereas if mm -hmm. I just tell them, they're just going to copy what I tell them and forget. But when you have to exert effort, that's when you learn, you know, and that kind of goes in line with a few like videos I've been watching on this uh, method or concept of active recall, where um, you can learn pretty efficiently by Basically, instead of taking notes or reading through notes or reading through highlights, the best thing to do is ask yourself the question about the topic and see if you then you have force yourself to put the effort into to try and retrieve the answer. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, active yeah, yeah. recall. Right. So you're actively trying to recall the information. If you don't know it, then you can give yourself a hint and try again. Um, or you can, you know, if you really don't know, then you find the answer. But then you need to ask yourself the question again soon, like. A few in a few days time and so it's like mm. through putting effort or forcing yourself to have to put effort that's how you're going to like learn and force your brain to kind of pull the information out rather mm. than just being told information and 
you know, around how many hours, I don't know about you, but I, I've spent hours and hours and hours uh, taking notes. And yeah. uh, I guess it was kind of a waste of time. <laughs> I never take notes, man. All of my training, all of my education, I've never bothered because mm. especially if the material already exists, like a lot of the time I'm taking notes of something that's already on a, on a board. Yes. Uh, like on a, on a PowerPoint. So I'm yeah. like, well, I'm just going to look at that PowerPoint when the time comes. Yeah. So yeah. there's no point. What I used um, to think is, okay, it's on the PowerPoint. Um, but I was like, okay, the professor's like adding some extra points to it. So I was like, yeah, I might as well take yeah. that. But then I thought if I write down myself, that will help me learn. Right. I thought like I'm, I'm putting effort in, so I might learn. So maybe that did help me like writing the effort side of writing. But then when yeah. it came to revision, I would mostly like, I guess, revise from just reading, um, reading the notes. Uh, I guess that, that, that doesn't seem to be the most effective way, you know? For me, for exams, it, uh, what used to work for me is the last minute revision, like literally cramming the night before. For some reason that would work with me. Like mm. I would leave it quite late and then, I'd be able to actively recall it if I actually spent the whole day previously just going mm. through everything um, mm. as opposed to leaving too much time or spreading it out too thinly yeah. because of stuff at the start I'll forget. Yeah. It, you know, in uni, I was, uh, was a bit weird because I was, not, I was hardly concerned about my marks. I was like, I don't know how to explain it, but when the marks come out for whatever exam, I was more concerned about do I actually know the, what I should know? Right. Rather yeah. than did I pass? Did I do well? Did I not do well? Um, if, for example, I felt I knew what I was talking about in that in that module and I failed, I wouldn't be too concerned. I don't think I ever failed the module, but you get the point. Right. Whereas most people in uni and this is what we're kind of tr trained to think, I think, or not trained, but this is the culture is like, did I pass? Did I pass? Did I pass? It's just about did you get, you know, that number that says you pass? Whereas mm. if we're in uni to actually learn, then it should be like, do I feel like I know it? Can I explain yeah, yeah, this yeah. stuff? You know, yeah. it's like a very different thing. But uh, if that's the case, like, I don't think there's anybody that really feels like they've learned much. Like exams have never taught yeah. you anything. It's, you only ever learn to, to get the marks on the exam. And then once you've done the exam, that's it. You just delete it even subconsciously like you're probably deleting it because that's all the only reason you you did it for because you're never going to go exactly, back to yeah. it but, the, but that's where the mindset will change it i think like yeah, if yeah. you're learning to learn uh just to learn just to know it just to whatever reason uh real reason that you own you believe in right then um i think you'll probably remember it better but that if you're like yeah learning just to pass then you'll probably yeah just throw it out the next day mm -hmm. to be honest mm -hmm. um Bro, I wanted to explain something actually I've been working on. Uh, it's called, uh, I, I found out this concept of a second brain, okay? Yep. It's like this concept of having a, a database, a searchable, very easy to search database of everything you've come across, everything, you, every idea you've had, every uh, piece of information or useful content that you've come across. And you kind of put it into this database and you add like little bits of information to it to make it searchable, right? So like you tag it, for example, you might have tags and all of this, and you could use different softwares to do this. So I've started to try and uh, build mine, you know, because I just think that let's say we, we were doing this podcast on uh, education, then I could go into my second brain and search education. I'll find all the piece of content that I found interesting on the topic and I'll find all my, uh, my ideas on it and other people's ideas and thoughts on it. I'd be able to take a look at it, highlight a few of them, and then we'd have a, probably a really good conversation and, and podcast mm. about it. Mm -hmm. So that's like the goal. I, and for now, it's just like throwing stuff into it, right? Throw, yeah. throw, throw a bit of information in, throw like a, a podcast that I enjoyed, throw it in there, tag it the right way so I can find it. Uh, I just have a random thought. Okay, just throw it in there. But then eventually, inshallah, the ideas, I'm, I'm going to have, imagine like hundreds or thousands of piece of content and ideas and, and thoughts um, to, to kind of look through. Uh, and and you can even set it up where you review it. So you might say, mm. right now, I'm very interested in, for example, parenting. So I want to review all my thoughts on parenting um, on a, every once a month, for example. Mm. And you can kind of go through it. So I'm quite interested, uh, uh, not inter excited about this. Like, I think it will be for someone like me who like enjoys uh, learning and uh, uh, and I guess I aim to be like putting out content maybe for the rest of my life. It's really useful, I think, uh, to have something like that. Mm, definitely, man. But it means that you'd have to go through everything 
quite like in detail like all that all that stuff i suppose would you be actively recalling stuff like in terms of um like say if you're a podcast you've listened to a podcast i mentioned about education but then you'd have to bring it up again and then yeah listen exactly. to the whole thing again you know yeah that's what you have to do so uh, I've got two sections. One is the way I just put content in. So whether it's an article or a podcast episode, I'll just put it in there. But then the idea is like once a week or something, I put a bit of time aside to write down a summary of the most interesting parts from that piece of content. And that goes right. into the ideas part of the brain. Yeah. And so the, then the ideas thing is what you would review. Uh, and mm. you can always, uh, whatever idea you come across, You'll be like, oh wow, that's really interesting. For example, you read it, you you know, you you wrote this down six months ago. You forgot about it. You're like, oh damn, that's really interesting. And you'll be able to see where you got it from, you know. Yeah. So yeah, so you yeah. can attribute it back to them. You could even, if you make it make a video using that idea, then you could even contact that person and say, oh, I made a video and it included your idea. And then they might, you know, they might share it or whatever. You know what I mean? Like all these yeah, things yeah, yeah. Are, are possible when you do it. So it's pretty. Uh, you know, if I was if I was talking to, you know, if somebody's going to uni or they're in uni now and, uh, you know, they're like 18, 19, 20, whatever, I would say tr maybe, you know, if, you, if you're, if you you know, a lifelong learner or you might you know, think you're putting out content or whatever uh, in the future, then start this now, you know, like just mm. bit by bit, add, add little bits. And as long as you organize it so it's searchable, then you can kind of like, if you want, you know, if you don't want to go all in, you could kind of just throw stuff in there and forget it. And it will yeah. almost definitely be useful in the future, you know? I mean, I've always, I've had this ever growing thought about leaving a digital footprint for my kids anyway, because it's oh. always, you know, well, I say always going to be there. So it might not always be there, but <laughs> yeah. the likelihood is it will still be there when, you know, you pass. Um, because if you look like 10 years, like there's kids that are 10 years old now, you know, fully competent and stuff. But 10 years ago wasn't that long ago for me. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. it's 2020. 2010, I it didn't feel like that long ago. Yeah. However, for, for, for some for some kids, it's their entire lives. So yeah. so yeah, in 10 years' time, I'm sure it's gonna be like, oh, that wasn't that long ago. But for them, you know, my kid's gonna be what a teenager or whatever at that point. Um so yeah, leaving some sort of digital footprint or files and folders or even thoughts, man, or like you've said, like a second brain almost, because I would, I'd feel very intrigued if I had access to things that my dad like, wrote down or searched or, yeah. or, was, or was thinking about or whatever. Like that would very much intrigue me. Yeah. Um, and you, you, like if you just write uh, an idea or a thought you had, you could put the date on it, right? You know the date. So you can see like, oh, damn, like he was, you know, 27 when he wrote that and he was thinking yeah. of this. And, yeah. That's the thing about like social media and stuff. Like you got to remember social media is all searchable. I mean, Twitter is a good example of that um you can literally search your username and then a keyword and it'll be any tweet with that keyword that you've put in um which is why um anyone who does use twitter i think if you'll go if you should use it then use it don't use it sort of aimlessly if you know what i mean or <laughs> be responsible no like, yeah just don't make it a place of arguing and sort of bickering and, and all of yeah, that nonsense man. because just have something of substance there. If even if it's an idea or a thought or something that is mm. like a, a moving quote, whatever it is, something that's there because that's the thing. It's searchable. That's my main thing with Bro, it. Oh, you like, know, a friend of mine a few weeks ago told me that he was searching for something, and he found a tweet of mine. Okay. Oh, really? And I was trying to think, like, because I know I deleted all my tweets be just before I deleted my account. So what's the deal with that? So it would it may be that somebody has quoted you and what okay. it because in old school Twitter, yeah, to quote someone it would the, the way it did it was oh. different. So like it will still come up if someone's quoted you historically, so not now, because now yeah. the way they quote it, your account has to exist. But before yeah. it would almost like copy that tweet with your name and yeah. then put it on their yeah. account. Yeah. 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 Therefore, when you search now, it will come up with your you saying it like i've seen that with some of my stuff because if you go if you search my stuff for a certain amount of time it'll be me and then it'll just the actual image of me will disappear and then it'll just be other people either responding to me or quoting me or whatever it is um so yeah like it's it's something to really pay attention to i mean if you use these things as digital diaries i think it's at the end of the day man like not much online disappears um yeah rarely but there's always going to be that sort of footprint there so 
And the thing is, you the same way that you cringe at yourself. Imagine your kids cringing over you, like oh your entire God. life. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. this is the bit where the the pious guy would say, "Well, you know, Yom Kiyama, everything's going to have a big, big footprint." True, true, big true, footprint. true, true. But the thing is, people, you know, in Yom Kiyama, um, everybody's concerned with themselves. You know, um, in that sense, everyone's concerned about their own footprint. Mm. But in this dunya, everybody's concerned about everybody else's <laughs> you know what i mean nobody's concerned yeah. about their own footprint here they're concerned about what next person's footprint is yeah, so man. imagine that both. like imagine reading all your tweets uh that you ever tweeted um to the whole of humanity and yeah, in man, front uh, of allah and the angels this is it like and this is just you know, your tweets this is not your actions or your honestly you know. bro honestly and it's a good thing to go like if you if anybody's listening and has access to old accounts or stuff like that, like go through it, man, because it's actually, it's very um, poignant. Like you will see stuff that you're, you just not say this day and age or, or things that you believed in or arguments that you thought you, you should make or, you know, disputes that you thought you should engage yourself in that you would not find yourself anywhere near today. And then it just makes you think, subhanAllah, like back then I thought that and said that with such conviction and, you know, I said it with such confidence and now yeah. like I wouldn't go anywhere near anything like that, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I would crazy. definitely, yeah, I, I probably could say I definitely regret most of my activity on Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. It's, it's just the confidence of saying things, isn't it? That's a mad, mad thing. Like, yeah. You have such confidence back then and then now. It's not it's not that it's not essentially like what you've said is wrong. It's just having the lack of wisdom and when to say it and yeah, yeah, exactly. are you just saying it for yeah. the clout sort of thing. So And it's part of it is because it's so easy to do it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's not it's, that much thought behind it. It's like they they <laughs> they made it easier by making the tweet short, you know. So yeah. because tweets have that character limit, it's almost like even easier even though in theory it's as, just as easy to like post on facebook as it is on twitter right but because mm. the the culture on twitter is that it's all short you just like boom 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly bro it's hard yeah hard definitely thing. embarrassing dangerous man. dangerous man dangerous but you can do it about anyone like what, what was your old twitter name was yeah so there's people that are like responding to you in 2015 mm. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a lot of it. It's 2015. If oh, I look. if I reply to someone, that would count as my tweet, and that would be deleted, right? Uh, possibly. I'm just trying to find one. What what was it? What was an example of? Mm, oh yeah. So so you used to be. It used to say RT, and then it would say what you you'd said. Yeah. So there's a oh, couple that was here. Old school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, look at this. This is um. You know, I, f I forgot his name. Saf. The, the digital reviewer, uh, he does a lot of super saf. That's the one. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's responded to you here. Really? Marshall. Yeah, back in 2015. What did he say? What was that about? It's about, and the declares the value. You're just speaking about some money or something. I don't know. I can't, I can't tell what the topic of the conversation the is. <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah, bro, but you're definitely about, you know, but like right right away, I can see who you've engaged with, who you're speaking to. I can't necessarily see what you've said. Mm -hmm. However, I can definitely see what people are replying to you about. Right. And it looks like lots and lots and lots of responses. So it must be that you're very active in talking to people as opposed to just shouting out in the air sort of thing. Yeah, lots of arguments. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, if, I think, you know, actually one of the most enjoyable things I think uh, I don't know if that it's smart, but the, one of the most the things I got the most out of Twitter from was like uh, conversations, like whether it's debate in terms of like people agreeing or disagreeing. I just maybe I didn't I didn't actually have uh, conversations about proper stuff in real life, maybe. So mm. I'm just thinking of the time when I was um, on Twitter and, and the most active it was maybe a time when I was a time when I didn't have many people to talk to, but I don't have many now either. No, no, but this um, is it. I agree, bro. And I, and agree. I think that's what I enjoyed about it. Like, okay, this is my opinion. You know, I'm like 22 and I'm like so opinionated. So uh, let me see what you've got to say, you know? And I, I think I liked that, um, especially okay. talking to people that I wouldn't usually uh, hear their opinion and stuff.
Yeah, it, it would definitely connect people across. I mean, even now, like I, although I don't converse with anybody, I do still like to see certain threads or talk, subject matters or whatever, but also the taste of people that I'm following is different. Um, mm. I don't like it entirely. I don't like what it's become because like, for example, I don't like the fact that it throws if you know when you like something it will throw that in your face it, like mm. well that's what a retweet is for so i don't want to see what people liked it's not for me to see mm. and because of that twitter just gets messed up with people Messy. liking things mm. yeah it's like i don't care what people like let me switch that off let me just see what people actively want to share towards me um anyway yeah bro mm. how long have we been recording just under an hour let's wrap it up with I don't know. I, I was going to say advice to people going to uni, but why don't we be a bit more humble and say, what would you like to have done at uni different? Um, uni, for me, it was because I had no idea of what I wanted to do, I ended up going to uni. Um, uh, I guess there was always things I was actively interested in that I never thought to study outside of uni um mm -hmm. for, for example like okay let's think about like investing yeah investing in the stock market or wherever like that was something that always appealed to me mm -hmm. but i was always intimidated by it and i yeah. thought you had to sort of go somewhere to study that it wasn't mm -hmm. until like you know it wasn't until like the past few years where i actually thought to enroll in mm -hmm. you know some sort of course online and just just to get an understanding i didn't basically there's a lot of things when you grow up that intimidate you um like taxes, for example, Ta like self being self-employed and, and, the, and the tax side of that and how to manage your accounting and all that stuff, that intimidated me a lot. Um, but that was something that I wish I'd just told myself to actively seek out and study online because it's, the material would have been there, you know. I think that's the thing. There's a lot of things that people want to do, even on the side, or entrepreneurship in general, um, that they feel intimidated by, oh, I don't know where to start or I don't know what to do. And I think... I don't know if there was the material as much as there is now. I'm sure there must have been. Um, but yeah, I wish I, I'd, I'd, I'd just told myself to do that. not Just to not be intimidated, basically. Whether I did or not is a, is a different story. I'm not, I don't have any regrets, but I, I, I want to empower myself to, to not be intimidated by things that only a bit of knowledge can, can, can you know, wash away that fear and apprehension. It's the same with everything. Like even now, bro, like 90% of the fears I had at work were just because of a lack of knowledge. You know, that's all it ever is. A lot of the fears and anxieties we have is because we're scared that we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Well, then the only thing that you need to do is expose yourself to that knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, and you'll feel a bit more confident and you realize actually you can do it if you just learn a bit more. And that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. I remember, I think when I got my first uh, digital marketing client, I actually, I was very intimidated and I was like, it, you know, it's not like I hadn't been doing marketing before, but it was my first ever client. And, mm. you know, I said to myself, I said, look, worst case scenario, I actually have these online courses I've taken. So I'm just going to implement that course on this guy's business. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that's really what it is, especially at the beginning when you're not that experienced. It's literally taking what you're, you know, if you've, you know, uh, learned from a good source, taking that and uh, applying it. And you, mm. you know, you master the rules before you break them. Uh, you know, you mm. break the rules when you get your own original takes on things. But at the beginning, yeah. you just kind of, kind of copy in a way. And there's Definitely. nothing wrong with that. I think I would say get a second brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, you know, it's the thing that no one will ever listen to, I think, as advice, but it's everyone would give the advice later, which is take advantage of your time in it. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I had a sense when I was at uni that I'm really wasting time. I, I did have a sense of it, but I still wasted it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because uh, I think our schedule was quite light maybe compared to other unis and stuff. So uh, I could have done a lot more, whether it's working. I mean, you know, job opportunities for young people are very limited in the UAE, but um whether it's working, whether it's learning, like you're saying, whether it's just reading a ton, whether it's um, volunteering, just doing, I think, you know, doing more, um, yeah. especially outside of my peer group, 
and my normal peer group, doing would have made me more confident, more competent, um, and just generally would have made me uh, much better off, you know, probably would have given mm-hmm. me, like when I get out of uni, I'm 21, it would have been like I'm 25 or something if I'd done a lot, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. A lot of experiences. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anything you want to add, bro, before we wrap up? Uh, no, I'm glad everybody enjoyed last week's episode uh, with 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 Papa Faze. <laughs> <laughs> yes, have the left. Yeah. Um, if there's anyone else you guys want us to have on uh on the mind heist flavor side of things, then um please suggest or if you if you yourself are a listener, you feel like you've got something you can uh share with us that would be yeah, you know, give different perspectives because that's something we haven't really had much of. Mm. Um then hit us up. We're always open to that. Um Mm-hmm. If not with both of us, then at least with one of us, you know, if we can arrange it uh, properly. Now with the, the use of technology, look how amazing it is. <laughs> um, I mean, my house is built upon technology, bro. Like you're in the UAE, I'm out here in the UK. Yeah, not possible like, without, without it. It wouldn't really, yeah. It wouldn't, well, at least not in this form, you know. But yeah, bro, that's, that's it for me. Yeah, you can contact us or recommend people to us, whatever. Uh, if you go to mindhousepodcast.com. You can also give us feedback and stuff there. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, the the episode with Faisal, did did we get anything on Instagram like people saying they enjoyed it or you just talk about what I showed you? Oh, just about what you showed me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I checked yeah. some comments and stuff on your YouTube channel as yeah. well. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's it really, bro. Yeah, I, I think uh, people really enjoyed that one. Definitely, man. Uh, that one and uh you know 79 of course with uh sharif those two oh yeah yeah those yeah, yeah. Two, the top i saw top that khalid khalid green had put up a youtube video where him and sharif were just sitting out in the boonies bro just talking bro. <laughs> i need to watch that i saw it earlier and i was like, oh i need to watch that yeah they're just literally just sitting on a couple of foldable chairs out in the middle of nowhere having a chat bro Sick. i need to watch that bro. <laughs> yeah it's probably cooling down over there a bit now uh, yeah. nicer weather it's probably hot usually but yeah cool okay uh thanks for joining us on mind heist uh, see you in the next episode inshallah subhanak allahumma bihamdik shadu wa nara ala anta astaghfiruka wa tubu alaik assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh